Right. I'll say good morning, everyone, again. Yes, good morning. Um, it's, uh, the first lesson is Romans 8, 28 to 30. And the first verse of that is a verse that we all know so well. I can remember in our sixth form at school, we used to really shout this at each other. That's about 60-odd years ago, so it's still true today. So 28, we know that in all things God works for good of those who love him and who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. And then we continue with Ephesians 1, 4 to 14. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasures and will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and understanding, he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. In him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we, who were the first to put our hope in Christ, might be for the praise of his glory. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. And the final part of the reading is Ephesians 2, 4 to 10. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ when we were dead in transgression. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. May we be blessed by the reading of that word. Amen. Um, my name's Jeff. I'm part of the church here and uh, been asked to bring God's word today for you. So, as it says up there, our salvation from heaven's perspective. Now, I wonder if, like me, you've read a passage of scripture, maybe a verse, and you've read it over and over again, you know it off by heart. And yet one time you read it, and you see it in completely different light. God speaks to you in a way you think, have I read this already? And that happened to me a few weeks ago, and I shared it during the service. And it was our passage from Romans 8, 28 to 30. And it wasn't the verse which spoke to me, it was the study notes I had. And it talked about where we're glorified. And the study notes said 
The tense of that word, glorified, means it's already happened. And I was sat up in bed reading it, and I said, Lord, I'm speechless. I don't know what to say. It so touched me. The Holy Spirit so washed over me. And so as I go through this message, my prayer is that the Holy Spirit will speak to you in the same way that he spoke to me and touched my heart because it, it opens up and it's just glorious. It's wonderful. But first of all, I want to go back to the beginning. And as the old song from Sound of Music, I think it is, the start at the very beginning, that's a very good place to start. And Genesis 1, verse 1, says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. It's fair enough. It's not a bad thing. And then John picks this up in his gospel. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And the Word was God, and he was with God in the beginning. Through him... All things were made without him. Nothing was made that has been made. It's talking about Jesus, who was the word. And as I read this, I thought, in actual fact, John perhaps should have said, before the beginning was the word, because to create something, the creator had to exist. And it's interesting, last Sunday, Mark said to me after the service, I'm leading worship next week. What are you preaching about? <laughs> when I'm told him, you know, <laughs> um, I, I love it when the worship leader says, what are you preaching on? And it's some obscure thing that there's not many songs about. But he, di he did really well. But before the beginning was the Trinity. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And... This psalm here says, before the mountains were born, or you brought forth from the whole world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. God always has been. He has always existed. He is without beginning or end. And so thinking about the Trinity, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, they've always existed. And they are in such a tight close-knit fellowship. They love each other dearly. They are so together. There is no other relationship like it on the earth. All three are and always have lived in perfect harmony and relationship. There's no competitiveness. There's no one-upmanship that we find here on earth. They exist in perfect union, honouring one another, loving one another. And there's no other relationship like it in the whole of the universe. Just think about that. There is no other relationship like it on the whole universe. And I started to get a sense of this one day of a long, long time ago when I read this verse in Matthew 12, and so I tell you, every kind of sin and slander can be forgiven, but blasphemy against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but anyone who speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or the age to come. And what Jesus is saying, you can say what you want about me, but don't you dare badmouth the Holy Spirit. And in that, I sensed such closeness, such high regard for the Holy Spirit, that Jesus wouldn't countenance anything being said about his precious Holy Spirit. And that started to speak to me of the bond there was in the Trinity. And then this other verse here, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Again, what it's saying is there is such a close union between the three. You grieve the Holy Spirit, you grieve the Father, and you grieve the Son. And we don't often think about that. But all three, you, you speak of one, you speak of the other two. 
And that is such a close-knit uh, relationship that they have. I've been reading a book recently called Jesus and the Undoing of Adam by this guy called C. Baxter Kruger. And uh, he's an American uh, theologian. And he writes about this, about the uh, Trinity. And he says, The life that God lives as Father, Son and Holy Spirit is not boring and sad and lonely. There's no emptiness in this circle. No depression or fear or angst. The Trinitarian life is a life of unchained fellowship and intimacy, fired by passionate, self-giving love and mutual delight. Such love giving rise to such togetherness and fellowship overflows with unbounded joy in infinite creativity and unimaginative goodness. And he goes on to say, God exists as Father, Son and Spirit in such a rich, glorious and overflowing fellowship. Note that word again, overflowing, that came up earlier. Overflowing fellowship of acceptance, delight, passion and love. The dream of human existence begins right here in the unstifled fellowship and togetherness of the Father, Son and Spirit. In sheer grace, the triune God decided not to hoard the Trinitarian life in glory, but to share it with us, to lavish it upon us. And here he's talking about the moment that the three decide they're going to share this, they're going to open up, they're going to invite. And as yet uncreated people to share what they have. Love overflows. Love spills over. Their love is so great, they want others to experience it. And they weren't, if you like, cont they were content, but they weren't content because they wanted to share it with others. And so a decision was made to create the creator God. And so we see, as we read through the first chapter of Genesis, how God put everything in order. It was an orderly fashion. It was an orderly creation. God created the environment to enable living animals, birds and beings, us, to function and to exist upon the earth that God had created. And we read in Revelation, you think, well, what are we actually here for? Yes, we can enjoy what God has given. We can enjoy fellowship with the Trinity. In Revelation 4, 11, I like this version from King James Version. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honour and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are created. God created everything for his pleasure. He created you and me for his pleasure. Even the sinful fallen race that we have become still created for his pleasure. And then, for those of you who've heard of this thing called the Westminster Catechism, it's a series of questions and answers about God. There's one in there about what is or how many are in the, the Trinity of God. And it says here, the first, very first article, very first question says, what is the chief end of man? And the answer is, the chief end of man is to glorify God, and we talk about glorifying in a minute, to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. I love that, to enjoy him forever. We don't hear many sermons about enjoying God. It's normally the other way around. But we're there to enjoy God. And then finally in Colossians, all things were created by Christ and for Christ. All things were created by him and for him. 
we're there for Jesus. I want to now move on into this mysterious passage, mysterious few verses in Romans. And it has occupied the minds of many great theologians down through the ages and I'm not going to attempt to match them, but just want to say a few things about them. And foreknowing here is synonymous with love. From the word to know, as we've read and we do read in the old King James Version, so man knew his wife. It's about knowing, it's about loving, it's about relationship. And therefore God foreloved us with his sovereign distinguishing love which we've heard about in the last few moments. And then in Deuteronomy, Moses is summing up the law in Deuteronomy. And he tells the Israelite nation, the Lord did not set his affection on you and chose you because you were more numerous than any other peoples. In actual fact, you were the fewest of all peoples. But it was because the Lord loved you. The Lord set his affection on them because he loved them. Pure and simple. And then 1 John 4, 8. This wonderful statement that God is love. Not only does he love, but his whole being, he loves. He can't help but love. And it's something that perhaps is foreign to us, it, trying to get our heads around this. But God is love. His very existence, his love. And as we saw, it spills over. He wants to share it. He wants to open up and enjoy fellowship with people and the relationship as well. And the scripture goes on to say that those God foreknew, he also predestined. And I know this is a cause of much debate about what it means. And as we saw in our scripture in Ephesians, it says God chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, there it is again. In love, he predestined us. For adoption to sonship through Christ Jesus in accordance with his pleasure and will. And I'm going to sidestep adoption because we don't have time. But he predestined us because of his great love. And in him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity to the purpose of his will. It's God's plan. He had a plan to open up the Trinity, to make the Trinity accessible and to share the Trinity with us. And it's all in accordance with the purpose of his will. And then in Romans, as we saw, for those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. God predestined us to be like Jesus. That was his plan. That was his determination. That's why he created that we should be like Jesus, like his son. John Stott, a great Bible teacher, says this about predestination. The common meaning of to foreknow is to know something beforehand, which is what we probably think of, in advance of its happening. Some commentators, both ancient and modern, have concluded that God foresees who will believe and that this foreknowledge is the basis of his predestination. But this cannot be right. Two reasons. One, God foreknows everybody and everything, whereas Paul here is referring to a particular group. And secondly, if God sees people because they are going to believe, then the ground of their salvation is in themselves and their merit instead of him and his mercy. Paul's whole emphasis is on God's free initiative of grace. I 
I want to just speak a little about, a bit about Chosen. It came up in a couple of our readings and the scriptures we've seen on the PowerPoint here. And there is another one as well. There's loads. All the way through the Bible, there is this common thread of God choosing people. He chose Noah. Got a job for you, lad. Build an ark. What? I'm a farmer. I do animals. I'll show you how to build it. And that was the start. And God, all the way through Scripture, has chosen people. This morning in my private readings, reading about Gideon, God chose him. Chose him to lead the people at that particular time. And there's another one, 1 Peter 2, 9 to 11. But you are a chosen people. And he's writing to the church here. A chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. That you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Lyme Regis Baptist Church, you are a chosen people. You are a royal priesthood. You are a holy people. Once upon a time, Lyme Regis Baptist Church didn't exist, but now it does. Once we ourselves had not received mercy, but now we have received mercy. And we are chosen according to God's plan. And this we find difficult to get our heads around. But it's God's sovereign plan. It's nothing to us about us achieving anything. Accomplishing great feats on earth or our background or social standing. God has chosen us simply and purely because of his great love. And Paul writes this in 1 Corinthians 1, 26 to 29. Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were first called into the kingdom of God. Not many of you. Note that phrase, not many. It doesn't say none. It says not many. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But some people were. But God chose the foolish things of the world. Now he starts to get a bit rude. God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things. And the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one can boast. We can't boast. Least of all me. Can't boast about we've done this, we've done that but God has chosen us. If, like me at school, you weren't any good at sports, I was rubbish at sports, especially football. It'd give me a ball and it would just go everywhere. And so when they chose the teams, guess who was the last one to be chosen? And that wasn't chosen. It was everyone's got to be on the team. Oh, Vane, you might as well go there. I don't want him, you have him. And that's... Yeah, it's, it's tough, I know. But... <laughs> That's the way it was. But God didn't choose us like that. God chose us because of his love. Not because of what we might be able to do and what we might be able to accomplish. And we perhaps could think about Wesley, George Whitfield, Smith Wigglesworth. You think, well, I can understand why God chose them because of all the things that they've accomplished. People like Billy Graham. People like Bill Hybels, who grew a church from a little half a dozen people in an upper sort of front room of, as students into a 20,000 plus church. Great influence around the world. And we can think of others who've accomplished great things for God. What about someone called Mordecai Ham? Who? Mordecai Ham. 
Mordecai Ham was a traveling evangelist over in America. And in November 1947, he was leading a revival series of meetings in the building when two youths slouched in at the back of the room and they hid up in the balcony out the way so they could see plenty of attitude as youth do probably chewing gum plenty of spots and pimples there under sufferance one of them was because his friend had bought him and Mordecai Ham preached the gospel and God worked in the life of both of them actually but one in particular and in the end of the meeting, Mordecai Ham gave a call for people to receive Jesus. And these two young men went down and they received Jesus. And one of them who was there under sufferance, who was it? Billy Graham. Billy Graham. What? a massive influence he has had on the world. <laughs> he was a spotty youth from a farming background, not much education perhaps, lots of attitude, and yet God used Mordecai Han to bring this book, young youth into the kingdom of God. It's brilliant. But we could say about this whole choosing thing, it's not fair. If God wants to, and if God says in his word, and he does in a couple of places, that God wants to save everybody, why does he choose people? Why does he only choose some? Well, that's a mystery. And you could say, God, why do you do that? And I bet he doesn't answer you. But we're looking through the telescope from the wrong end. Because what is fair is that God chooses some. And then after fact, God chooses a lot and lot of people down through the ages. That's what's fair, is that God chooses some of us. Again, out of this whole th thing of the, the Trinity overflowing with love, God in his mercy, God in his love, chooses people and has done down through the ages, over the centuries, over the millennia. God is still choosing people. And thousands are coming to faith in Jesus every day around the world. And those he predestined, that you also called. There is that call, there is that urging of the Holy Spirit the call of God is to know God more, to respond to the gospel message. Is that something inside us when we hear the gospel message? And I think back when I was a youth quake in my 20s, not really knowing what it was about, not really understanding what the guy was talking about. And yet at the end, when there was that call, I've just felt this urge to go forward can't remember praying the sinner's prayer. All I remember is was saying, now say thank you, Father. And you think, well, don't know that you were saved properly. You didn't say, you didn't mention repentance. You didn't pray this. You didn't pray a proper sinner's prayer. And incidentally, I have since then many times just to make sure. But at that moment, God accepted me. He saw my heart. Think of the thief on the cross. Two of them. One reviled Jesus and rained down curses on him. The other said, Jesus, when you come into your kingdom, remember me. And Jesus saw his heart and he said, I tell you the truth, today you will be with me in paradise. God saw his heart. Didn't get baptised. Didn't get baptised in the spirit. Didn't do great exploits didn't preach the gospel he just died and yet Jesus accepted him called him into the kingdom of God and yet we don't even know his name and yet we still honor him for what that guy did and those he called he also justified precisely at the moment 
we ask Jesus into our lives, we are justified. There's no training course. You don't have to do a probationary period. You don't have to go through assessment or have reports written on you. The moment we ask Jesus into our lives, we are justified. John Stott again. Justification is more than forgiveness or acquittal or even acceptance. It's a declaration that we sinners are now righteous in God's sight because of his conferment upon us of a righteous statement, which is indeed the righteousness of Christ himself. It is in Christ, by virtue of our union with him, that we have been justified. Someone says that it's just as if I'd never sinned. And that's how God looks at it, how God looks at us. And here's the main meat, really, of my message. And this is a bit which so spoke to me. Those he justified, he also glorified. The problem is, over this week as I've been reading commentaries and I've been studying, not one person told me what glorified mean. Not one explained what they meant by glorification or to glorify. Fortunately, Strong's concordance came to the rescue. And some of the meanings of glorify, and glorified and glorification means to praise, extol, magnify and celebrate. And we do this towards God. And we can understand this. That's what we do. We glorify his name. To praise, extol, magnify, celebrate. To honour. Do honour to or hold in honour. To cause the dignity and worth of some person or thing to become manifest and acknowledged. And as I said, this is what we do to God. And this is what we've been doing this morning. And we can understand this. And yet, from what I read, glorified here means it's already happened. We have already been glorified in the courts of heaven. So therefore, God does this when we become a Christian. And so our salvation from heaven's perspective, some of which we've looked at, Jesus said this to his disciples in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who think they don't need to repent. And rejoicing here means celebration, jubilation, elation, delight and so on and so forth. There is great celebration the moment you ask Jesus into your life. The moment each one of us who are in Jesus. This is what happened. It's a party. It's a celebration. Because they know what it costs for us to be able to do that. And the struggle we go through in, in tussling, shall we become a Christian? Shall we not? And people go through months and maybe years of battling before they decide to ask Jesus into their life. And so this is, this is great celebration going on in heaven. The enormity of our decision to ask Jesus into our lives cannot be overstated, both here on earth, but also in the courts of heaven. They know what it costs. They know what it costs for us, and they certainly know what it costs Jesus to enable us to do that. And so there is this honouring, there is this glorifying, there is this magnifying us going on in heaven because they know the struggle and they celebrate our decision to accept Jesus. It makes Jesus work on the cross all worth it. Paul writes this in Colossians, When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. 
he forgave us all our sins. Having cancelled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us, he's taken it away. He nailed it to the cross. And I love this bit. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them. He rubbed their noses in it by triumphing over them by the cross. This is Jesus' work on the cross. This is what it was all about. This was the whole of God's plan as they discussed up in the courts of heaven, in the Trinity, amongst themselves, the whole plan of mankind. And this was part of that plan. And so, our last reading this morning, I don't know whether you picked it up, it says, we are seated in heavenly places. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. God raised us up with Christ. He's already done it. We can understand that. He raised us up with Christ. And in the same breath, in the same sentence, Paul writes, and seated us in heavenly realms. Now we can perhaps understand, I can understand that when we die, when we go to heaven. But he's saying, we're seated already with him, spiritually. Already seated with him. We have a place in heaven already. We have relationship with God the Father, Son and Holy Spirit in the courts of heaven. And I found this which helped understand. The tense for the word seated means the action occurred in the past, called an aorist. And its effects remain true now. In that case, it is true that we were seated with Christ in the heavenly realms at the point of our salvation. And this is why I've given it this title, Our Salvation from Heaven's Perspective. Not from an earthly perspective, from heaven's perspective. It's, it's not a whole different scenario, but it just changes the whole emphasis. It just causes us to rejoice in, wow. We see things from heaven's perspective, or should do. When our eyes are open, when God illuminates our hearts. And this is what happened as I read that explanation about glorified. Again, that's an aorist. It's already happened. And that's what blew me away, thinking we are already glorified. God honours us because of our decision for Jesus, magnifies, extols. He blasts it across heaven. Do you see what these people have done? Do you see what that person's just done? Accepted my son, believed him. That is why there is this praise, there is this rejoicing in heaven because it glorifies Jesus in his work on the cross. It makes it all worth it, makes it all understandable. And from heaven's perspective, that is why they are rejoicing over one person who repents. And then down through the ages, over the last 2,000 years, there's been millions and billions. There's a, lot, there's a lot going on in heaven, a lot of rejoicing, because we have decided to follow Jesus, make him Lord of our lives. And so seated there means we have a place in heaven already. <coughs> We are recognised. We are honoured. God points this out. Do you see that person? Do you see that person? They made Jesus their Lord and Saviour. All the work of Jesus on the cross was made real, was made meaningful because we glorify Jesus and accept him into our lives. And so some of the not repercussions, but some of the outworking of our salvation should be this. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. This is Paul speaking to the Ephesians in order that you may know. And there's one or two other things before that. 
But one of them is this, that you may know his incomparably great power for us who believe. So we can know God's power because we believe. And then Paul goes on to illuminate us and say, that power is the same mighty strength that he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and power, authority, dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in this present age, but also in the one to come. Paul's saying, I pray that you might know the same power that God had when he raised Jesus from the dead. And just a couple more scriptures before I finished. When Jesus called the twelve together, he gave them power and authority to drive out all the demons, to cure diseases, and he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God. Still under the old covenant, where the Holy Spirit is given to specific people at specific times. Same with Gideon, given the Holy Spirit for a specific time, for a specific time specific reason but then in Matthew 28 the great commission and Jesus said to them all authority same word as authority in Luke 9 has been given to me therefore you go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and then Mark also sort of amplifies this commission when he says, go into all the world, preach the gospel to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptised will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will accompany us, those who believe. In my name, they will drive out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up snakes with their hands. And when they drink deadly poison, it will not hurt them at all. They will place their hands on sick people and they will get well. What happened? After the Lord Jesus had spoken to them, he was taken up into heaven and he sat at the right hand of God. Then the disciples went out and did what Jesus had told them. They preached everywhere and the Lord worked, worked with them and confirmed his power by the signs that accompanied it. The disciples were seated in heavenly places while they were still on earth. And they worked out their salvation. They did what Jesus had told them. And the Lord backed them up. And we see them moving in signs and wonders. And Chris talked about this, I think, on Wednesday at our prayer meeting. Just this whole thing about the power of God in us and working through us. And so I hope and pray and have prayed that as we've gone through this, um, the Holy Spirit's been working in the background. And I hope you've seen and caught something of what I felt when God spoke to me, when the Holy Spirit spoke to me about being glorified and the fact that we are already glorified in the courts of heaven. And in some way it will... Change your perception, if you like. You're thinking, we come from a different background. We come spiritually with a different mindset. Father God, we just thank you for the power of your word. And we just ask, Lord, that now, Holy Spirit, you would speak to our hearts. Catch us up into the glory of relationship with Father, Son and Holy Spirit to catch again that great love which spills out, which overflows to mankind. And for us, especially as we have this relationship with Jesus, to catch us up into that glory again, but also to give us and enable us to have a different mindset that we come from a different position, from we see things from heaven's perspective. And we might be even more effective for you, I pray. In Jesus' name. Amen.